Today's episode is sponsored by a new online bookstore, indielector.store, is unlike any other. Indielector.store offers great prices from top indie authors and supports authors at the same time by paying them more for their books. Indielector.store has a readers club that gives you free books and special deals. Watch the Indielector.store continue to grow before it opens in the fall of 2019 at Indielector.store. Hurston Wright Legacy Award winner Sandria Fay presents Mourner's Bench, the story of brave, bold women who led the civil rights movement in the Arkansas Delta. Set in 1964, the story unfolds from the perspective of an eight-year-old who feels ready to be baptized, but increasingly finds herself torn between the traditions of her community, her church, and her mother's progressive and feminist views. Mourner's Bench by Sandria Fay. Available now everywhere books are sold. And now on to the show. Greetings, beautiful ones. This is Dr. Akua Gray with A Life of Peace Wellness Institute, and the name of my book is Holistic Sexuality, A Practical Guide to Sexual Healing. This book is basically about learning how to move from a stagnant place of sexual malfunction or dysfunction to a more higher vibration when it comes to your sexual relationship with yourself, with your mate, And also when you look to use sexuality in the healing processes in every area of your life, including areas like communication, multiple family structures, as well as getting to know a little bit more about yourself and where you would want to be in terms of the wholeness that is possible from a sexual point of view. Book Lovers Unite! I'm Demetrius Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. In each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing sex. A lot of times we get wrapped up into the physical aspects of sex, but we tend to forget about the spiritual side of sexuality. And that's what we're going to be discussing today with Dr. Akua Gray, the author of Holistic Sexuality. Dr. Akua Gray has an abundance of information in regards to sexuality, natural healing, spirituality, And she's going to be speaking with us today about how we can establish even deeper connections with the ones we love. And it starts right now. Holistic sexuality is a spiritual discipline that is learned and lived with a constant flow of complete openness and honesty. It nurtures the highest quality of life that can exist between a man and a woman. Holistic sexuality is the answer to not only a blissful sex life, but also a life that is filled with free-flowing energy that mends broken relationships, promotes positive thinking about coexisting in peace, and, if lived to the fullest, will bring forth a life that enhances a system of longevity. The essence of a sexual healing union depends on both openness and honesty. Openness meaning relating to each other with a trust that is free of fear and deceit, and honesty, the truth will always be told to facilitate true growth in a relationship. It is sexual energy that empowers us with the ability to make man. Therefore, Enabling the divine qualities of both male and female, sexual energy exemplifies the divinity and balance of man and woman as co-creators. Sexual energy yields itself as a guide to the natural powers of human attraction. The energy that has shaped the world is sexual energy. 
billions of people exist in their respective areas of the world through sexual energy. Every human has life because of sexual energy. The reason life continues to exist on earth no matter what man has gone through is because of sexual energy. It is the one power that humans have the ability to use for eternal existence. The power of sexual energy is common knowledge for the masses that choose to indulge their minds on this level. However, what is not common knowledge is how to use this powerful energy for healing and balancing the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of life. Most people live life in a state of permanent sexual dysfunction. There is, however, an alternative to the primitive drive, and it equates more closely to divine will. Holistic sexuality brings awareness to the individual and the couple of the sacredness of the bodies they possess. Also, their quest for longevity is enriched by the proper nourishment of the energy exchanged in sex. This energy exchange directly affects the internal organs, the central nervous system, and the endocrine system. Holistic sexuality exercises the mind in two ways. First, mind is energy. It has no physical form. The mind is the constant reminder that there is always an interconnection between man and woman. This shows up as attraction and desire, which can very easily lead to a sexual encounter. The underlying factor to consider in this most primitive interrelation is that people were divinely designed for each other, and that designation was intended to be eternal. Man for woman and woman for man. People, however, they vibrate on different frequencies. So the levels of attraction will be based on energetic compatibility. The thought process involved in coming together brings the mind into alignment with the need to remain in constant contact with self through the body of another. Second, once the male and female connection is made, the mind then surrenders to the autonomic nervous system and goes into a state of trance. This semi-conscious state is the doorway to a moment of peace and relaxation that the mind needs to facilitate calm and unity for survival. Holistic sexuality on an emotional level strengthens the limbic system by activating a series of central nervous system responses to touch. Touch activates the endocrine system's glandular functions and releases hormones that help to bring about the mind's surrender and prepares the body for orgasm. Sex is an intensely emotional experience of sharing that enriches the ability of humans to respond positively to outer body stimuli. The spiritual components of holistic sexuality include all of the above. When the consciousness of divine union is brought to the sexual experience, sex becomes a meditation, trance becomes a prayer, and purpose living is enriched. A couple can develop unconditional selfless service to one another and inspire the growth of the relationship. As couples grow together, their moments of internal peace turn into minutes, hours, days, and years of blissful sexual expression that heals in every way. Welcome to the realm of sexual consciousness. Forget about what you've been taught about sex if it doesn't set your mind in a state of peace. Holistic Sexuality, a Practical Guide to Sexual Healing, is a truth resource for people to form new thought patterns about the benefits of sex as it relates to strengthening the spirit, reconnecting to the divine, 
achieving immortality through sex and creating physical enhancements and manifestations that last a lifetime. So when I was in college, I learned about Tantra, which is the Eastern philosophy for achieving spirituality through intimacy. And reading your book on holistic sexuality brought me right back to a lot of those principles that I'd actually forgotten about. (laughs) But I remember just how earth shifting it was to discover that basically everything I knew about sex at that time was wrong. And I feel like there's a lot of listeners who are going to experience that same shift today. Why is it that we're so misinformed about sex? Well, actually, I, I, I would say it's twofold, and I do deal with that a little bit in the book as well, in terms of why we have developed into such a sexually dysfunctional society. So first off, you know, the media, what we see in the media in terms of relationship, everybody's emotionally insane. You have that dysfunctional type of love that you see so often in the relationships that are put before us in in terms of the things we watch. I love you, but I cheat on you. I love you, but I lie to you. I love you, but I hit you. I love you, but, you know, you make me sick. Those kinds of dysfunctional ways of relating. And so when a person grows up, seeing that not only on everything that they watch, but also sometimes in the home, then that in itself creates a pattern of sexual dysfunctionality just in terms of how people see each other, relate to each other. Mm -hmm. The second, I think, is religion. And religion meaning that most of the dogmas and the doctrines that are pertaining to sex in the major religions that permeate the majority of the world deny the sacredness of sexuality. It denies the sacredness of sexuality. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is that oftentimes people are taught, you know, don't do sex. You can only do sex at certain intervals of life, when you've accomplished certain things, et cetera, et cetera. But on a biochemical level, that's not how things work. Mm -hmm. Because when the pituitary gland turns on and the reproductive hormones start flowing in the body, it creates a natural time clock for whoever that person is of when they will begin to see attraction to be attracted to the opposite sex, of when they will begin to understand that their bodies have grown to a point to where they're experiencing sexual desires. And no religious dogma has anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. That's a natural, I guess we could say, God-giving aspect of who we are as human beings. And so since religion is so confining, when it comes to our sexuality, that in itself is a direct contradiction which creates dysfunctionality because people live with the hypocrisy and the lying about their sexuality because they want to fit into the quote unquote doctrines Mm -hmm. of their religion. And so I think that those two things are the major things that people have to deal with in terms of what creates dysfunctionality. Because when a child, okay, and we'll say a child because, you know, most boys come of age around, you know, 14, 15 years old, same for the girls, sometimes a little bit earlier for the girls in terms of their menstrual cycles. Mm -hmm. So when those aspects of a person, Okay, start to develop and become overwhelming for that person. Nine times out of 10, and you can check with the people that you know, if the doctrine says, wait until you get married to have sex, you can probably pick one friend out of 10,000 who waited. (laughs) (laughs) This is true. In fact, 
out of all the people that I talked to when I was doing research for this book, I knew only one out of the many hundreds of people that I talked to. And it was it was just like, OK, we've been fighting against nature mm-hmm. when it comes to this trying to correlate our sexuality with what religion is teaching us. Yeah. You've alluded to this already. So what does real spiritual sexuality look like? Oh, my goodness. It begins with the individual being a whole person. And that's the difficult part. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know how to work to balance themselves emotionally. Make sure that they are consistently physically healthy mentally retrain their thought patterns so that it works to maintain a level of peace and consciousness when it comes to relating to each other. And then on a spiritual level, making sure that everything that they do is towards their spiritual ascension. Very few people live like that. Mm -hmm. However, the holistic sexuality seeks to get people at least started on the journey. And I think that this book is also, let me let me just say, based on my being married for 30 years. And I chose to write this book because I realized that so many people that I talk to in the healing work that I do as a doctor of naturopathy, so I do a lot of counseling. Mm -hmm. So many people's journey was not my journey. My journey was not like a whole lot of people. What do you mean? Sometimes I sit down in front of people and I literally hear horror stories about and traumas of different types of sexual experiences, you know, because when you hear things, you know, automatically you go internal with it in terms of of looking at what you've gone through in in an effort to relate. And one of the things that really sparked is is I facilitate a sister's group that's called Sacred Goddess Temple. And I realized in talking to many of the women who have gone through that sister circle, there have been so much trauma in terms of abuse, molestation, you know, women needing abortion recovery, you know, bad relationships, you know, domestic violence, those kinds of things. And when I stopped and looked at myself, I realized I haven't experienced that. So when I sat down to write this book, I wanted to give a positive point of view because that's what I have. In naturopathy, one of the things that I teach my students is you can only give what you have. So what I had to give in terms of relationships, sexuality, all of that has been positive from day one until today. And so the positive experience, I think, has to be told also because the negative experiences far outweigh the positive experiences. And so I wanted holistic sexuality to be a part of that positive experience, a part of that positive teaching about our sexuality. So that's what I had to give. And that's what I mean by my situation was nothing like any of them, any situations that Mm -hmm. I've ever heard in terms of first time sexual experiences, in terms of living with a maid, having the same husband for 30 years, etc. So I I felt like I needed to give this gift to humanity. Was there a specific point where you realized that you can't wait any longer? I have to write this book. Yes. After um, I did counseling with a young woman who was going through a domestic violence uh, situation. And we counseled for a while. And she made some commitments to herself. And a few months after the commitments that she made to herself about the changes that she was going to make, she didn't make the changes. And she stayed in the relationship and the abuse continued. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm the type of person in in terms of, uh, you know, relating to those that seek my help. I don't like beating dead horses. Okay. 
And so when I give a person it's what I have to give and it's not their time to move from the situation, whatever it may be, karma or, you know, uh, emotional depression dependency or whatever it may be, then I I felt like at that point I needed to produce something that people in that situation that that young lady was in could take with them as a reminder, not just me sitting and talking because, you know, they say you don't halfway remember most of what you hear, but if you have something to take with you to help guide you through the changes that you have in your hand that you can refer back to, that was the inspiration, is wanting to provide that hands-on source for mm-hmm. people that was going through what that young lady was going through. I love the quizzes you implemented in your book that help to identify the type of sexual person you are, or rather your sexual maturity. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, That's the sexual maturity quiz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk about that? I thought that was really interesting. The sexual maturity quiz pretty much just relates to where a person has matured to. Um, The lowest level of sexual maturity would be the physical level. Mm -hmm. That's where a person pretty much just operates according to their animalistic nature about sex. And then you have two in-betweens. I don't want to give it all away, but (laughs) you have two in-betweens. The next level is the mental level. And so the mental level being a step above the physical level means that you do a little bit of thinking. And then the third level of sexual maturity is the emotional level. And then the last level is the spiritual level. And that is what I hope that people will strive for when they read the book, is to operate at that free-flowing, honest, spiritually enriching, not only for themselves, but everybody that they come in contact with, whether it's a sexual relationship or not, will vibrate at that spiritual maturity level in life, not just sexuality. But um, there's a series of questions that a person would answer, and depending on their yes or no answers, it's kind of simple. They can uh, add up their score at the end, and based on that score, determine where they are in terms of their sexual maturity. And I've worked with a lot of people on this. In fact, sometimes when I do book signings, I give free sexual maturity tests. <laughs> and, you know, people are always interested. So, you know, I have these questions on a sheet and, you know, they sit down, they fill it out, and then I give them a five-minute talk about their results. So people do find this quiz uh, very enriching. And I would say probably about... Mm, of the people say that they definitely can relate to the score that they get on the test. Well, years ago, when Tantra became mainstream, people tended to focus on the tantric practice of delaying orgasm, which could extend physical intercourse for hours. Your book also discusses orgasm retention, but you go deeper into explaining the spiritual and the energetic purposes behind such a practice. Specifically, (laughs) the three-day rule for men. What's that about? Ah, okay. (laughs) So, you know, I'm a naturopath. So understanding how the body regenerates itself was the basis for the three-day rule. Mm -hmm. And when I first presented this three-day rule to the, the public at book signings and lectures that I've done on the book... Uh, I would often hear (laughs) men in the audience would get up and say, what, do you mean I can't have sex but every three days? (laughs) (laughs) And I say, no, that's not what I'm saying. (laughs) I'm saying you shouldn't ejaculate for three days after you have an ejaculation. And so I explained that. But the three-day rule basically says that it is beneficial for a man to allow his 
body fluids to regenerate his um, his sperm and also his semen to regenerate because there is a biological component an energy component that activates the sperm in our system that's how they become alive and that link is directly linked to the spinal fluid of a man and so if a man ejaculates consistently one time right after another right after another now and 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 let, let me explain it like this so let's say a man has not seen his mate for a week or two and he's really ready for some beautiful sexual encounter well he's rested his body for that long okay about a week so when he actually ejaculates after resting for a week it's a very powerful and strong ejaculation well, let's say he gets a little greedy or maybe she's in her season of needing a little bit more sex and they have sex in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, or the next day, the morning, the next day, the evening, the next day, the morning. Eventually what happens is instead of the semen and the sperm shooting out powerfully, okay, the man's ejaculation becomes less and less and less powerful and potent. And the semen will eventually just start trickling out, okay? A very slow trickle. And so what he has done is he has actually overworked himself, in terms of ejaculating consistently and constantly. So I established the three-day rule for men as a health regimen, really, is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not trying to restrict anybody from sexuality or anything. So I say to the men that I work with, if you want to remain healthy, then you may take up the practice of injaculation instead of ejaculation or either give yourself a rest three days in between each ejaculation to allow your body to go through its proper regenerative processes. And it takes three days for the male's semen to refurbish itself, so to speak, to the most potent point that it could be. And for those who are unfamiliar with injaculation, could you explain that or could you define that? Yes. Injaculation is where a man allows the pressure of ejaculation to build up to the point of ejaculation. And then he either stops or changes the rhythm of the sexual experience so that the semen and the sperm does not actually come out of the body, but it actually goes into a state of internal vibration that is, as I'm told, I'm not a man, (laughs) but as I'm told, actually feels like an ejaculation, but on an even deeper level because it vibrates the body even longer than an ejaculation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my most trusted sources for men that I send them to when they're really interested in learning about this is Montauk Chia's book, Taoist Secrets of Love, Cultivating the Male Sexual Energy. And there's Mm -hmm. also one for females, too. Yeah. Yes. What's interesting is that a lot of guys don't realize that orgasm and ejaculation are two completely separate things which is what can allow for that ejaculation, but we've associated them both together. So when you have the orgasm, you ejaculate. Right. But they can be separated. Right. And you know, it's it's very interesting that looking at it on a spiritual level in terms of the uh, the orgasm, the orgasm is that if, if anybody knows anything about meditation, we think about getting to the the, the space in between the thoughts, as some of our master teachers have called it, or the point of being in a no-mind state. Well, one of the things that happens is we have a trigger in our hypothalamus gland. And the hypothalamus gland actually takes a pause during 
orgasm, to allow that intense rush of energy to overflow the entire body and feel that high vibration. Now notice that when we have an orgasm, it doesn't last long because literally you could lose your mind if you were in that state for an extended period of time. <laughs> So it's very interesting how we were designed. I mean, the creator just de designed us divinely mm -hmm. because that state of bliss, so to speak, that happens to us and for us when the orgasm happens, you know, it's not something that we could live with on a consistent basis because it would be energetically too much for us. Yeah. But we got that little taste of it. And the reason why we got, we have that little taste of it during our sexual encounters is because it's so blissful. We want to experience it over and over again, which also perpetuates procreation, Yes, which is exactly what it was meant for. Yeah. So in order for us to continue to exist in this world, we keep going back for a little taste of that blissfulness. And then what comes out of it is more people, more people, more people. As they say, let us make man. <laughs> Regarding sexual healing, you discuss sexual reflexology, which I've never heard of before. So essentially what it is, it's the ability to heal the body through certain sexual positions or, or do I have it completely mixed up? Yes, actually. Well, not necessarily certain positions, but uh, sexual reflexology has to do with the nerve endings that are in the reproductive organs. So there are certain nerve endings that are relative to the internal organs that are within the vagina. And there are certain nerve endings that are relative to the internal organs that are on the penis as well. So with sexual reflexology, we label it as the upper, the middle, and the lower parts of the penis and the vagina. And so when a person is dealing with certain issues, a concentration of the sexual movement can be concentrated in a certain area of the penis or the vagina to help stimulate the energy of that particular organ. Again, like reflexology related to the hands and the feet. So it's a focus of those nerve endings. And then it also, in sexual reflexology, is relative to the depth of penetration as well. So if a woman is having issues with the heart, then the depth of penetration in the healing process of not only sending positive energy to your mate, but the depth of penetration would be concentrated towards the deepest part of the internal part of the vagina, which is near the cervix. And so I explain a little bit about that, you know, just as an overview. It's not something that you got to go to school for. It's just a matter of knowing it and getting the rhythm, so to speak, of concentrating the movement between the partners in those particular areas. So when it comes to sexual healing, of course, um, I think men find it more appealing. <laughs> <laughs> And men find it more appealing. Oh, <laughs> I'm having a cough. I need some sexual healing for my lungs, you know. <laughs> and he's like, I'm your medicine, baby. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did not think of it that way, but you do have a point. Sexual healing can be fun. It's something that's self-taught. The partners would talk about it first. And it's a very reliable medicine, I'll call it. It's a very reliable medicine when people use it properly. What I also loved about your book is that you go well beyond sexuality and discuss relationship intelligence. Can you define what that is? Yes. Relationship intelligence is really sitting down and evaluating who you are and how you relate to your mate. Oftentimes, as they say, you attract that which you are. So if, if a person is dysfunctional, confused, 
any of those types of things. That's that's who they are. So nine times out of 10, they're going to attract someone that is vibrating at that same level mm-hmm. as they are. Absolutely. And so a person cannot expect to be totally dysfunctional and then attract someone who is a spiritual angel. It, it's just not going to happen. Incompatible. That's right. Because someone who is vibrating at a higher level of spiritual consciousness, you know, the, nine times out of 10, they're not going to even look your way in terms of their standards for encounters. So when we talk about relationship intelligence, it first begins with taking care of yourself. And if you want to attract a certain kind of person, you have to become that person first. Absolutely. And so in relationship intelligence, we talk about who you are. There is a relationship checklist. There is also some questions that you have to ask yourself about your life. There is also a way of looking at who you are in terms of different personality traits. I also go into that as well, because again, you can only give what you have. And in naturopathy, one thing that we say is in order for you to be a healing source or healing force for anybody, you have to heal yourself first. So relationship intelligence kind of takes us there first. And then we get into the different formulas. I give 12 formulas for a healthy relationship and the things that have to be discussed and worked on individually and collectively when couples come together. And in fact, these 12 formulas are the foundation of the relationship counseling that I take couples through, either premarital counseling or postmarital counseling or whenever they're having relationship issues. These foundation formulas are the very first things that we talk about because if a couple can get these 12 things together for themselves and then work on them with each other, then they're looking at a life of longevity and happiness together. Hmm. And, you know, not even happiness, but peace, peace together. What advice do you have for people who may be interested in these topics, but may be afraid to explore further or who may have a partner who just isn't interested? I would just tell them, you know, look at your life. And if your life is not the way you want it to be in terms of your relationship with yourself and your relationship with your partner or your uh, significant other or your mate, you know, your husband or your wife, to look at some positive things that you can do to change it and make it better. Okay. Then the second part of the question was with the partner aspect, I would say if you work on you and it is meant for your partner to change, be the example that you want to see in your partner. You cannot force anybody to change. So therefore, if you want to see more spiritual, emotional, mental and physical health come into your relationship, then you be that. Nine times out of 10, if the relationship is genuine, if the people are truly compatible with each other, the partner will become interested in the positive changes that they see in their mate. Hmm. So it's kind of like lead by example. Yeah, right on, right on. Well, Dr. Kua Gray, it was a pleasure having you on today. Where can readers go to find more about you and your work? Oh, absolutely. I'm on most of the social medias. It's too many of them to keep up with now, but I'm available on Facebook. Holistic Sexuality has a page. You're more than welcome to go and like it and get sexual tips every now and then that I do post. You can find me on Google at uh, Akua Gray. You can find me on YouTube as Akua Gray. You can find me on Instagram as Natural Love. And also my websites are dracuagray.com 
and also a life of peace.org, which is the nonprofit organization that we have for wellness education. And with that, we're going to wrap up another episode. Thanks again to Dr. Akua Gray. If you have any questions or comments for her or for me, or you know an author who you think would be a good fit for the show, let me know. Connect with me on social media. I'm on Facebook and YouTube. Or send an email to info at ch1podcast.com. Be sure to check out ch1podcast.com where you can listen to previous episodes and hopefully find your next favorite author. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Overcast. Be sure to leave us a five-star review. And most importantly, tell everyone you know about the show. Well, once again, that's it for me. You all stay awesome. Till next time.